Yeah, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session. Um, on this morning in the beautiful city of Vienna and um, to all of those joining us online. In today's session, we are diving into a topic of critical importance, the intersection of citizen science and a rapidly changing world. I'm thrilled to introduce our keynote speaker, Shannon Dose-Megan, an influential leader in the field of open environmental data on community-driven science. Shannon's work with the Open Environmental Data Project and her rich history of leadership in organizations dedicated to environmental innovation and open science has positioned her at the forefront of our fight against climate change and biodiversity loss. Her talk, The Challenge of Continuous Adaptation, Citizen Science for a Changing World, will explore how we can all play a part in shaping our future of our planet through science and community engagement. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Shannon Dosmegen. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Hello, hello. Okay, are we good? All right. Thank you so much, Exa, for having me. Um, it's been great to meet so many new people, um, learn about your work, and then also hear from uh, colleagues that I've known for a bit longer about some of the new trajectories and the work that you're doing. Uh, I think it shows a lot of potential for where citizen science is heading. My own thinking and work is done um, in collaboration with a lot of colleagues. I'm an open practitioner. It's very important to me to have collaboration built into everything that I do. Um, as they are in attendance, and I see two of them streaming in right now, um, I'd like to specifically acknowledge uh, Francois Gray, Heidi Ballard, and Muki Hockley. Um, they've known me since I was in my 20s and have been very patient and supportive colleagues, friends, and mentors of mine over the years. So um, their partnership has meant the world, and I really encourage you in spaces like this to find similar people to take with you through your professional lives. Okay, so today we're going to talk about how we work in an era of rapid change and discontinuity. What is a citizen community participatory science for a changed and changing world? What can we contribute from the practices of citizen science? How do we need to adapt? And where are the opportunities for meeting the unprecedented change we're experiencing in the forms of technology outpacing policy, uh, transformations through open science yet becoming mainstream, climate change and the loss of biodiversity speeding along faster than solutions? But first, let me figure out how to move slides forward. Uh, tech folks, it's not working. Sorry, y'all. I work in technology, and this still happens, so. <laughs> Nothing's clicking. OK, there we go tap instead of click. All right, um, so I'm based in the US, if you can't tell, uh, in Louisiana on the Mississippi River in New Orleans. We're known for Cajun and Creole food culture ways, an abundant diversity of wildlife from marine to avian. We're home of Mardi Gras, and we've also welcomed the oil industry into our state like no other. Um, so as indicated in the map in the upper right corner, um, you can see you know, all of the oil, the petrochemical uh, refining facilities that we have um, and that we live downstream from in New Orleans. I believe that the places and people we're from and encounter are an important backdrop to how we approach the world. So much of what I'll talk about uh, you know, translates to other places and projects, and there are certainly lots of other examples that I could have um, drawn from, but I've decided to really frame my talk around where and what I have worked most exhaustively on, which is in this region um, and in the, the south of the United States. 
A bit more context about my background. Um, yesterday, Francois introduced me as an eco-activist during a session, um, and I'll definitely you know, pin that label on with a lot of pride. Uh, but I also now consider myself a practitioner, an organizer in the sciences, working alongside institutions to figure out better strategies of participation with the public. After working with organizations and open communities for years, I'm also really intrigued by questions of how organizations and projects shift, change, innovate, and avoid stagnation. And finally, I'll mention that I, uh, I really love keeping a side eye on pop culture. Um, I think it's incredibly relevant to having a general tempo on the world. So you most certainly will see a cat of TikTok with relevance to citizen science in one of my later slides. Just going to forewarn you. All right, so um, I'll start with a brief narration of my trajectory. Um, I've gotten quite old in this space, and I probably don't know about 90% of you, so we'll start there. But first and foremost, I care about changing circumstances for people and creating the circumstances under which people can identify those changes and solutions for themselves. In my mid-20s, I began working with a small organization in Louisiana that initially focused on community-based air monitoring with residents sitting adjacent to the massive petrochemical refining operations across our state. Emissions from these facilities aren't stable, and the ability to take grab samples using the buckets pictured and documenting pollution through analog tools such as odor logs and observational diaries was essential. Here I learned about the importance of socially situated data, so data that doesn't just give the numbers, but helps to tell the story of a place and people. Collecting data on the playground of the local kindergarten, for instance, indicated the quality of air that kids in the neighborhood were breathing. While working with this organization, the 2010 BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico happened, and with it came a media blackout in part through the imposition of a, um, I've tried to convert this, 915 meter or 3,000 foot flight cap, uh, which made it really difficult to capture timely, detailed imagery of the progression of the oil spill as it was happening. This was the coming together moment of Public Lab, um, the organization that I worked with from 2010 to 2020. During the BP spill, the idea was that we could put together community satellites made from recycled and easy to find materials. And so with about 250 people from across the Gulf Coast, we would then attach these rigs to tethered kites and balloons and send them 457 to 915 meters or 1,500 to 3,000 feet above the Gulf to capture images. Public Lab evolved from this moment to build on elements of community monitoring, open source tools and practices, and a civic and community science framework that focused on collaborative modes of action, practice, and production across the life cycle of environmental scenarios. We worked alongside and in support of fence line and frontline communities around the world on a number of topics, ranging from you know, where I'm from, oil and gas, to mountaintop removal and mining. <clears throat> During the early, early years of Public Lab, the hardware portion of open science um, was still a stepchild, and I, I think it actually still is sort of a stepchild even in 2024. So in 2016, as part of a group of researchers and practitioners, including my colleague Francois, who were passionate about the potential for open hardware as a tool across scientific practices, from physics to biology to citizen and community science and environmental monitoring, we came together under the banner of the Gathering for Open Science Hardware to start building bridges between our work and think about the broader infrastructural needs of the open science hardware community. Much of my work in the open science space has advocated for the role of open science hardware as a key part of our scientific infrastructure and as instruments for scientists, government, and communities and their activities. And you'll hear mention of this throughout my talk. Whenever I have the opportunity to bring in open hardware, I certainly will do so. Which leads us to today. Um, during a 2019 sabbatical I took from Public Lab, I started thinking about the complexities of data sharing and how we build common approaches into environmental governance. While we were collecting data and getting people engaged, my questions started to sit most cleanly within changing the landscape of environmental governance, enforcement, and compliance. How could we start to shift the culture and regulatory landscape of communities holding the burden of proof to show environmental damage and public health issues to one that valued public input but didn't require it as a first step in building healthy environments? With Open Environmental Data Project, we're working on infrastructure and systems, approaching environmental data problems as multifaceted, 
oftentimes requiring socialization of new approaches, clear opportunities to transform workflows, and policy or institutional change rather than new technical tools or products. So <clears throat> when I started this work in roughly 2009, 2010 to date myself, uh, the world felt a bit slower. It was more analog. Uh, we were able to center on humans rather than race along at the pace of machines. There was an allowance for messiness and experimentation with the internet and in citizen science. And there was room for growth and critique in the space, room to challenge and do things differently. But we're in a rapidly changing environment, and the desire to do participatory forms of science is not always meeting the realities and challenges. We need to collectively ask as a community, what does it look like to do citizen science in a changing world? What are the essential elements of citizen science that we can build upon? And what needs to change when we're up against a multitude of challenges, such as the climate crisis, political instability, and rapidly changing technology? So to be able to meet the moment, um, there are six major and influential shifts that I believe citizen science will need to be aware of and engage with. The internet. <laughs> I heard you. The evolving role of infrastructure. The commons. How we share and influence. AI. And extreme politics and policy that we have to work with them. So let's talk about these a bit. Um, what is citizen science primed and prepared for? And what is different that will require us to change? So first, the internet. The internet back in 2008 to 2010 was still coming into its own. While people were able to contribute content at that time, much more structuring led us to the ability to contribute data. Social media had yet to be standardized, and it showed places where alternate forms of governance and socio-technical solutions could help solve some of the cracks in our formal governance systems, hence the rise of things like OpenGov, Gov 2.0, civic technology, civic science, crisis mapping, projects you may have heard of, such as Ushahidi and OpenStreetMaps. The type of work I was doing with Public Lab in our early days was in part made possible by using the resources of the internet and civic tech tools to connect local action via data about a massive oil spill to the world. People could in turn watch, they could support, and they could even be part of a solution by helping us to make sense of that data. Back, to, back then, it felt like there was lots of possibility. And um, you know, so many people worked on and continue to work on the internet as a democratic space of information sharing. The ability to share information in a frictionless way, essential to the early internet, is still there. But the internet has become full of players and platforms. So while self-gathering and information finding are still part of the potential of the internet, it is now full of empires, uh, with six of these empires controlling an astounding 48% of internet traffic in uh, 2023. Um, and we know what happens to empires. They change all the time. So we're at a place in the history of the internet um, that's evolved from pure experimentation, where there was room to move and new places for people to plot and try ideas, to a controlled environment that makes the experimentation difficult. And this complicates the experimentation environment for citizen science as well. Next up, we have infrastructure. So while the ability for people to collect, share, and make sense of data has grown exponentially, the importance of infrastructure is still an underdog. Infrastructure can be the physical, technical, and digital ways that we work, but also the people, the culture, and the politics of institutions that play roles in this infrastructure. While we've seen exponential growth in citizen science projects, we continue to spend far less time as a community resolving the issues of infrastructure that can allow for better access, findability, sharing, and using. Infrastructure can also help us to think in more robust ways about resource sharing, community building, and better overall governance of projects and data. Recently, for instance, the US federal government has propelled millions into advancing community monitoring, environmental justice, and support for addressing climate change. One of the programs has specifically focused on community air monitoring, with funding going towards, I think it's about 132 different projects. However, there is little support included for ensuring that projects don't duplicate, are able to speak to one another, and don't create scientific redundancies that could be alleviated through intentional spaces of dialogue, community building, and data governance. 
or technical assistance that helps projects to address requirements from agencies funding this work that create incredible challenges and barriers to even being able to accept the funding from requirements around accounting practices to strict QA, QC requirements, quality assurance, quality control, sorry for the jargon. Uh, impactful citizen science and environmental monitoring requires not just a modernization of supporting infrastructure, but a re-envisioning through identifying it as a necessary pillar or backbone upon which community monitoring and citizen science rests. Third, the commons. So part of the shifts we've seen are in how we think about and use the commons. And I'm building on the work and trajectory of, you know, Ostrom's classic notion of the commons concerning community-based governance of what she calls common pool resources, you know, amongst others. In earlier formats, the commons were about the preservation and conservation of our shared resources, such as the classic example of oceans. But many of those shared resources are now polluted by externalities that thwarted these attempts at protection. Perhaps we now need to consider our commons in different ways. Um, so commons as shared resources that have been extracted and polluted. Commons as shared places of knowledge building and management, for instance. So let's focus on knowledge building and management, a place where our tools have vastly increased in the last decade. How we conceptualize the commons can now help us to think differently about the work of citizen science by asking, for instance, in a changing world, how can we create a commons that moves us from project-based modes of production to the creation of spaces and ecosystems for collaboration around shared environmental causes? The commons can also help us to address tensions that tend to exist in the language and use of open versus proprietary, instead foregrounding decisions centered on dialogue in which shared resources and strategies are created that people can access, places exist where community can be built and maintained, and where conversations and shared learning lead to tactics for deepening access to the mechanisms of environmental governance and decision making. This is fundamentally a new understanding of the common beyond the, the public and private divisions, but one that the time is ready for and can be a principle of collective organization in citizen science. All right, the next is influence. So um, this one is complicated because it involves social media um, and other content platforms. Um, I have a pretty strong love-hate relationship myself um, with social media. Uh, a bit begrudgingly, I share relevant work content on Twitter slash X. Um, on my Instagram account, I enjoy sharing pictures of spring in New Orleans and uh, you know, scrolling the enormous depths of cat videos when I can't sleep at night. Um, but social media is also linked to mental health issues in young people and mis disinformation you know, run rampant on these platforms. But how we produce, share, and influence with citizen science is like night and day from 15 years ago. Uh, when the way we influence was still hybrid, requiring grounded interventions and maintenance of deep relationships on top of a digital footprint, our world has changed. And to be frank, we don't have the luxury of time to be doing citizen science that isn't going to matter for people, the environment, our climate, and science policy. So we need to pay attention to the new ways we influence. Who is influential and how they can be influential has shifted in remarkable ways and to keep up with this, we need transformative thinking that squarely places the work of citizen science as the centerpiece of supporting people and becoming communicators and storytellers in their own right, and identifying the places of influence that citizen scientists and scientists can have in transforming science, policy, funding, and changing the way that the public cares for and engages with pressing issues such as biodiversity loss and climate. The last decade has seen the internet shift significantly um, so that you cannot get something to distribute broadly without negotiating with you know, the platforms. And if you try and just stick something up on the internet hoping it'll change the world or even just a conversation, it generally is not going to happen. Citizen science, for better or for worse, needs to evolve to engage with the masses through restructured and critical engagement with platforms. Okay, AI, so now we're onto the machines. While we don't really know much about where AI is going and what will happen, we do know that AI is joining fire, wheels, the printing press, fossil fuels, and the internet as one of the big technological innovations and disruptions that has propelled humanity forward. The world is going to experience a fundamental shift, and citizen science will need to be prepared. Fifteen years ago, we were excited by the power of the crowd and crowdsourcing, which would provide new data in a vastly amplified way. 
AI is now amplifying that amplification of the crowd and working with data in ways that I wouldn't have previously thought possible when I started this work many years ago. It's also being seen across a number of citizen science projects, obviously non-conclusively um, iNaturalist, where images can be identified via an AI model trained on the large database of research-grade observations of iNaturalist with the goal of improving image and audio classification, LeafSnap, which uses computer vision for the identification of tree species in the northeastern United States with the goal of accelerating the digitization of biodiversity research specimens. eBird is using automated reasoning and machine learning to verify the accuracy and consistency of contributors' submissions. But a lot of the finer points about hey, how, hey, um, how AI will transform science and citizen science are nuanced and require significant attention. For starters, as Marissa Ponti of University of Gothenburg, Sweden, points out in an interview with Simona Serrato, when we combine artificial intelligence with citizen science, do we aim to maximize productivity at the expense of democratizing science? In the context of citizen science, we should also be asking, how will AI affect inclusion, local priorities and values? How do the values of citizen science become part of the AI it uses? How will participation in citizen science be impacted? In the last decade, we've been through significant technological change, but AI is going to vastly change the world in known and unknown ways. All right, politics, you knew it was coming. So politics and science have had an uneasy history, and the extreme political environment that citizen science now has to exist in is set to increase. Um, a brief historical interlude to help us think about how we got here. At the beginning of World War II, neoliberal democracies believed that science was key to moving the countries forward um, for both economic and military investment. Now the same democracies have large constituencies that don't believe in the application of science and have politicized scientific inquiry and results. For instance, in 1950s United States, the government saw science as important for progress, but because of the shift in the 1960s, largely led by carbon-based industries, a shadow settled on the science of climate because of the doubt it threw on economic benefit. When the same science that enabled industrialization also pointed out that we were walking straight into a climate crisis, industrial capitalists started waging war on scientific inquiry. So this shift has been happening for well over half of a century, but has become extreme in its outward stance and insatiable as it becomes a device of politics. For instance, access was shuttered to large swaths of information in 2016 as the US Environmental Protection Agency went dark during the Trump administration. Science came under attack as misinformation fueled the US response to COVID in 2020, and I, I think this definitely happened in other places as well. And by the time the Biden administration took place in 2021, ready to plow millions into environmental and science uh, funding, federal agencies had little capacity to do the necessary work. Outside the US, after Brexit, UK's annual share of research funding declined, potentially impacting the careers of researchers, postdocs, and fellows, and causing concerns about retention of scientists. While in Argentina, the campaign promises of the newly elected in 2023 president threatening to dismantle the National Scientific and Technical Research Council, which supports about 12,000 scientists, are starting to come to fruition. If citizen science is to live and thrive amongst an environment of extreme politics, part of what the citizen science community must do is be prepared for those alternate places of influence during politically extreme moments, those which create unstable, hostile, or unsuitable conditions for citizen science to be part of the landscape of connecting people with science, environment, and place. So while this may be an unpopular sentiment, after the work numerous people, and Mookie, I promise, I am not trying to change the definition of citizen science, um, you know, lots of people have thought about terminology around what's citizen community civic participatory science. Um, I still want to ask us at this point, is citizen science expansive enough for the all hands approach we need to address environmental and societal challenges? What is citizen science so that it can meet this moment? And what does citizen science in the future need to look like so it can thrive and be part of an economy of solution-oriented science? To ensure citizen science is expansive enough for the future that is rapidly upon us, there are essential th things that through citizen science we've learned, tested, and iterated upon and amplified. There are also strategies that can help us be more nimble as we move into the next decade. 
So let's start with a few of those powers of citizen science that should continue, increase, and ensure um, to become more impactful. To illustrate these, I've intentionally selected um, some of the examples of projects that people may be less familiar with, and especially those that may not cleanly fit in the definition of citizen science or even call themselves citizen science, and you'll, you'll hear why later. So first, Commons approach, um, which is done through a focus on the frameworks and governance that guide how we collectively make decisions. Citizen science projects have demonstrated through formal and informal agreement and structure how to maintain multi-person and organizational projects. A great, for instance, of this, and there's many others, is the Internet of Water. They have an uh, integrated system of information technologies, which include common standards, formats, and tools designed to make water data easy to find, access, and share online. And this system is connected by an organizational network of water data producers, users, and hubs. The next is collaboration. Building on collaboration early, often, and in unexpected places, such as budget management, data analysis, and academic publishing, um, is really important to citizen science. So this ranges from citizen science projects uh, to even some funding agencies that support or ask for early and upfront stages of collaborative development before the other work of the project will start. Open team, um, and please search all these groups because they're, they're just really cool and you should know about them if you don't already. Um, open team is a really great example of this. They're building an open, interoperable tech ecosystem that enables farmer control of data, knowledge sharing, and access to programs and marketplace incentives. They also run workshops and in-depth learning series to develop stronger support systems for farmers and ranchers. They maintain a connected technology toolkit that supports adaptive soil health management. And they're focused on equipping food system leaders with the knowledge necessary to navigate and apply this ecosystem themselves in order to, to transition to regenerative agricultural practices. Third up is um, our use of open practices, principles, and licenses, which help us to share, access, and build tools for citizen science. Open communities also provide interesting cases for how to conduct dialogue on governance, frameworks, and collaborative behavior in citizen science. While there are many examples, Zooniverse is a, a classic citizen science project, um, but the application of open science into citizen science is vast, from open access and publishing policies to open data standards and the application of open scientific hardware into citizen monitoring projects. Next up is infrastructure. And while I noted earlier that infrastructural priorities and capacity have changed over the last decade, which presents new challenges, Citizen science does demonstrate the power of connectivity, especially between our digital and social infrastructure. The Beyond Compliance Network, and uh, full disclosure, this is one of the projects I work on, is doing this work through um, being in collaboration with different government agencies, researchers, and practitioners to understand and suggest systems redesign for the reuse of open data used around issues such as environmental health and climate impacts. The next, a diversity of voices will make us go farther. So working across disciplines, geographies, and strategies can strengthen our approaches. I've been heartened by the more frequently occurring integration of the social sciences and humanities into citizen science, the development of citizen science into new do uh, domains of inquiry, and the networks of community monitoring that have been literally built down pipelines, oil and gas pipelines, to collectively build strategy, strength, and multidimensional advocacy. For instance, digital democracy has a set of tools that have been co-created alongside partners that range from technological mapping tools to audio-visual tools for connecting stories to GIS data, and also a space for Earth Defenders to share strategies and training for their advocacy. We also have gotten better at grounding and local solutions and recognizing the histories of epistemic injustice or how we unfairly treat different types and sources of knowledge and science. In an article on responsible innovation, epistemic innovation, and air monitoring, my colleague Gwen Ottinger wrote about epistemic innovation or the creation of new epistemic resources, concepts, categories, and metrics that help us understand the world and our experiences of it, saying that because epistemic resources are both incomplete and unevenly distributed, epistemic innovation is important for making more aspects of the human experience legible. Epistemic innovation can be seen in the ways that once data and information are available from a variety of sources, we can move from epistemic justice to innovation based on grounded local responses. 
For instance, Atlanta-based CHARS partners with researchers, practitioners, and tech developers to create community-centric and appropriate results from their collaborations. Next is trust building and relationship building as part of the science that we do. We've learned a lot about relationships in citizen science, and there has been a tidal turn in which we see an increased allowance and ability for relationship building to be seen as a central and fundable part of citizen science work. We also are seeing more support for the advancement of projects that serve as the critical intermediaries and or bridge builders, the actual social infrastructure of citizen science work. Um, a great example of this that I've been just deep diving into, which I suggest you do as well, um, is uh, the Exchange for Local Observations and Knowledge of the Arctic. Um, it's hosting long-term and ongoing catalogs of contributed knowledge on topics such as traditional place names, weather, indigenous foods, circumpolar bear ceremonialism, and observations from the Seasonal Ice Zone Observing Network. Finally, Citizen science has gone through rapid lessons in learning, and so in exchange, we're able to offer this as one of our collective strengths. Learning is built into everything that citizen science does. We've become well-versed in multi-directional teaching, learning sharing that happens both in and well outside of institutions, that integrates local knowledge and process and cultural appropriateness. This is one of my favorite places where open science hardware and citizen science come together and present great scenarios for learning. Looking to the world of conservation tech, um, so Conservation X, Wild Labs, um, and as highlighted here, the Aribata Initiative, um, we see how, tech in, how to teach and engage students and the broader public in learning that is meaningful to people in place while also doing and creating with your hands. So for instance, uh, Aribata has a suite of tools ranging from biologging to acoustic machine learning, and they're building learning modules for use in their STEM-based uh, Aribata club. All right, um, I know that was a lot, so here's the list. And you can take a moment if you'd like to, to take a picture. And this is, you know, it's not conclusive. Um, I, I think I started with like 30 points and that was, that was too much. So whittle it back to this, um, so keep adding to this list. All right, um, but with all the changes afoot and a rapidly expanding set of questions, citizen science has to be part of a response to. What else can we do to meet this moment of unprecedented change? So I have four suggestions as we start to wind down our time together. We build a framework of continuous adaptation into our work. We acknowledge the future will be found at the fringes. We embrace encounters. and We think about how our work influences in different ways. So first is continuous adaptation where we borrow from nature, uh, sorry, technology. Uh, so we're borrowing from nature a model of adaptation and then apply it into our spaces of innovation. So nature is infinitely adaptable and we can apply this to the inf uh, innovation landscape as well. Um, and this ultimately both impacts and is a part of citizen science. The adaptation of nature follows specific patterns in which there is uh, diversity, selection, and then amplification. At the same time, the history of life is in exploiting environmental niches and adapting to those niches. Humans are really good at this. I mean, look at all the, the different environments that we've been able to adapt to. Our ability to adapt means we can be a part of our own future. So to, to promote this change-based mindset of robust experimentation, we need to mimic the processes and the innovative work that we're doing around diversifying by trying out different approaches with different points of view selecting, so choosing the one or ones that work, and then amplifying those characteristics. The project-based nature of citizen science can work really well under this framework, and it pro uh, promotes a diversity of data and people, but we need to get much better at selection, so to ensure we aren't creating redundancies in our tools, and then also amplification, so that we're focused on the impact of our work. Organizations, projects, and society are equipped to handle disruptions, but we don't do this by moving from one static state to another. We do this through understanding how to constantly and dynamically evolve. Sorry, technology catching up. Okay. I love this example of adaptation. Um, while this picture is from the, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, um, I was in Anchorage, Alaska a couple of years ago and saw a similar gut parka, which is translated from the Eastern Aleut dialect, um, and this dates back to the late 1800s. It's a great example of our ability to adapt to a place and resources, in this case, um, the gut lining of marine mammals, 
uh, use trial and error to innovate, and then amplify a successful design, resulting in what is probably the earliest example of high-tech wind and waterproof clothing. All right, so our next point is um, the future is found at the fringe. The fringe is where we will see the most diversity of thought because the fringe is a place that welcomes encounters. The fringe is also more comfortable living with encounters that challenge orthodox thinking. So a few examples to help illustrate this. Um, open science, though it has become more institutionalized, gives us lessons from open communities on building in practices and tools to citizen science that have been transformative. So documentation practices that show us how to discuss failure alongside success, scientific hardware components that move us towards better access to the physical tools and infrastructure of science, data practices that would steer us away from duplication. Open science also helps us to think innovatively about policy, such as some of the work we did featured here in the recent series by the Federation of American Scientists and the Woodrow Wilson Center, capping off the 2023 uh, U.S. Year of Open Science, giving us the ability to test out ideas around data collaboratives, um, open scientific hardware as part of the infrastructure of environmental monitoring, or federal offices of co-production. Other examples include groups engaging in multi-sector collaborations or engaging with environment and science through the lens of governance and knowledge networks, including groups such as Local Contexts and their traditional knowledge and biocultural labels, Opti Institute, who has created a participatory data stewardship training manual with the inclusion of citizen science, and the Earth Law Center, focused on the rights of nature and appropriate governance strategies. One might say that citizen science started on the fringe, or perhaps it's still on the fringe, uh, but then think about what lay at the fringe of citizen science for far too long, environmental justice or open science, for instance, and how significant an impact they have had on citizen science when we create bridges. Especially for those of us that represent institutions or are embedded in institutions, finding ways to increase encounters with ideas that challenge your own without co-opting them are really good ways of refreshing your thinking. So let's talk about encounters. Encounters are novel moments that breach normalcy, they present an other, and they challenge your present. This can be a person, context, content, experience, or idea. The interaction of an encounter has three outcomes, opportunity, dismissal, or threat. An opportunistic encounter embraces the fact that the encounter can challenge your present and identity, so your beliefs and self-image, for instance. An opportunity that threatens, challenges your way of being, and can cause fear, anxiety, or even the need for flight, escaping the context to be comfortable in a familiar system of meaning. But dismissal is the most important for us today. Dismissal relegates the encounter as something that is inherently not interesting or should be compartmentalized. A dismissal is carried out by judging, labeling, and boxing. Our brains prefer dismissal so they don't have to build those new neuronic pathways to take in information. It tries to find a pre-existing pattern that the new data can easily be placed within. So this means you have to work really, really hard to overcome dismissal. And I think this is important for the field of citizen science to hear because many of us are judged individually and specifically based on what we produce. We are still built into academic and institutional systems that overall promote and accommodate individualistic points of view and achievements. Institutions teach us to defend our point of view, but the whole point of change, transformation, and innovation is to change or challenge your point of view through constant learning. So I really encourage us to think about this in our daily lives and in the projects that we're part of. And then finally, I told you, cat of TikTok, here we go. Um, so influence. If we want to do citizen science for the sake of citizen science, we probably don't need to think about influence. Um, but if we want funding for citizen science, we want to influence policy, we want to change the minds and hearts of people, then we need to influence. As we talked about earlier, influence is being conducted in vastly different ways than it used to be. For instance, TikTok is the largest platform of learning in the world, and you can do everything from watch people remix videos about a cat that sings ha he to people teaching operational procedures or giving us updates on the climate crisis. So what does influence need to look like in citizen science? It isn't necessarily about becoming a social media celebrity, uh, but it is about disseminating information widely and in a way that can drive the impact we want to see. So I want people to learn about the decline of a snail species. Um, I want people to understand the impactfulness of a data sharing agreement that I created. I want citizen science to have a stronger role in science policy in Austria. 
Understanding the impact you want to have and then returning to that message of amplification we talked about will help us to build better strategies for citizen science to be influential. I read a Substack every morning by Heather Cox Richardson. Um, it's about American politics, connecting history with current issues. Her ability to present and then reach has fundamentally transformed what I know about the depths of American history. And with 1.2 million others reading along, it's potentially doing the same for them. Or if it's easier to equate to your work um, on Star Talk, Neil deGrasse Tyson's YouTube channel, a recent episode of The Mystery of Mushrooms, which was basically an hour-long presentation uh, on mushrooms, uh, captured the interest of over uh, 300,000 people as they connected to the topic through an engaging conversation between a mushroom expert, a comedian, and your personal astrophysicist, Neil deGrasse Tyson. So what do you want to fundamentally transform about how people think about science, climate, biodiversity, and the community you do citizen science with? What is your meaningful influence, and how will you get it out into the world? All right, so we're at our last couple of slides. Um, and to wrap up, I want to leave us with several concepts to consider as we think about a citizen science for the future. The first is that um, the new normal is discontinuity. So change will continue at an unprecedented rate and pace. This is not going to slow down. Um, we cannot design citizen science for a world that is patterned and stable, but for one that is in flux. We can do this by embracing encounters, looking to the fringes, and building in models of adaptive innovation to our work. The next, okay. the next is to find the unfamiliar, listen, learn, and engage. So this is in part you know, one of our principles at Open Environmental Data Project, and it helps to keep us focused on constant learning and engagement. As a community, we have the ability to build in intentional and specific cycles of engagement and questions about, for instance, AI and other emerging technologies using spaces such as an exaconference. Constantly question what you want to transform with your citizen science work and then seek to engage with the critical conversations on whether the tools, frameworks, processes, and strategies for dissemination meet the moment. The future will not be in curation, creation, but curation. The amount of data and content we currently think of as overwhelming will become even more so with advances in AI. Curation will become increasingly important as people seek succinct information responsive to what should I know, what should I learn, what should I do. While we will still create and collect, supercuts of information with the most significant highlights will become important, so we'll need to learn to better curate uh, to influence the work of citizen science. Scale simple solutions. So there are big problems and challenges, and many of the answers we need are right in front of us. Look at the list of you know, the powers of citizen science, build your own list, um, that's all there. Um, or you know, look at the places in our work where simple tweaks will lead us to something that's vastly usable, uh, such as an analog design that serves a better purpose in creating a new technology, or you know, something you can just use and build on uh, that's open source, that someone else has already produced. While we should be on top of tech, uh, we don't need to be completely engulfed in it. Humans do trend towards major advancements, but as we know, empires come and go. And at the end of the day, you know, just remember that humans are really great at adaptation. So the same qualities that led to the climate crisis are also the same things that can solve the problems that we created. And citizen science can be a tool to help us do this. Um, so we learn lessons from our history, we take what works, we document and put aside the things that don't work, we build in new strategies for collective approaches, and we can adapt to the changing world around us. So yesterday during the panel, one of the questions was, you know, what's, what does the future of citizen science look like? And so I quickly jotted this down, but this is where I would like to end um, with my future vision of what citizen science is. It's kind, it approaches scientific questions with humility, and wraps in care of the knowns and experiences of people living a place, time, or social occurrence. It takes time to deeply engage with emerging ethical and practical questions about tools and strategies before wholeheartedly embracing them. It won't be enough anymore to do citizen science because there's a cool question or project. The planet does not have enough time left to meander through these kinds of segregated approaches. And instead, we'll approach the world with the understanding that common knowledge, data, information, processes, practices, and the human co collaboration it takes to create that commons will be our number one consideration. 
It will be a science that requires other sciences to do better in addressing our shared challenges, and it will have a stance, and it will use that stance to create the next generation of citizen science stewards all throughout science who will do their jobs far better than my generation has done. Thank you so much for having me. It's really been an honor to speak to this group. Um, I will be writing up this talk at a later date if you want to grab my Medium link, um, and then you'll just have some of the points available. But otherwise, thank you, and if there's time for questions, I guess we could do that. Yeah, thank you very much, Shannon, for this very inspiring and rich talk um, on the future of citizen science and also giving us the opportunity to reflect on uh, the challenges and the opportunities that citizen science has and will be having in the future in this very fast and never seen before, very fast uh, pace changing world. Uh, we do have now about 10 minutes uh, for question and answers. I have here the microphone, please um, take it close to your mouth so that we hear you well. Who would be, who would like to be the first person? I see one there. Hi, Shana. Thank you very much. Um, from your experience, can you tell us a little more how you deal with uh, power conflicts? Controversies. Power conflicts and power conflicts and controversies. Oh, controversies. Um, yes. <laughs> um, I. That's a. It's a hard question because I think every situation is unique, um, and so you have to be able to accommodate what those conflicts are going to end up looking like. Um, I am a facilitator. Um, I'm a trained facilitator, and um, I think that's important for everybody. What we, is that me? Oh. Um, I think what we tend to do is we, we box learning how to do dialogue building and facilitation into you know, one person who shows up and does that in this space. But I think we all could benefit from learning the basic lessons of how we build bridges in dialogue, because um, that's really like, gotten me a lot of places when I walked into a room with climate deniers and you know, we're talking about climate change, for instance. Um, but it's really, you know, we could, we could chat a bit more about this afterwards because I think it is, um, it's very situation by situation. Okay, another question I see up there. I don't have the guts to throw it that far <laughs> up. I don't. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Hi, Shana. Thank you for your very insp inspiring talk. Um, I wanna. I have a question in how citizen science can engage more with the current generative AI development. I know you're focus is more on open environmental data, but, uh, sorry, yeah. But uh, as we know that uh, uh, what is connected most deeply with, within our conscious is the current development in generative AI and huge corporates and uh, how do you think we can go forward in terms of advancing um, in infrastructure for citizen science engagement and uh, open science? Well, how would you uh, suggest us to move forward with that? Yeah, I'm, thanks. Um, I'm certainly not an AI expert, and I sat in on a session yesterday, and I think they are here, so please, colleagues, talk with her. Um, but, you know, and I, again, know the, uh, the U.S. context the best, um, and I think the, some of the most interesting work is coming from um, smaller organizations and uh, grassroots in initiatives, and especially people that have left big corporations at the early start of AI, to say, you know, we're not taking the time to put in place processes around, you know, what, what does inclusion look like? What is ethics? How does representation happen? Um, and so I think working alongside, you know, 
If citizen science wants to learn the entire field of AI, you can do that, but I think finding those partnerships um, with institutions and organizations that are asking those critical questions about AI and then bringing up the questions that we're starting to face, uh, you know, what does is, what is democratized science look like um, when we have machines that are taking over, you know, biodiversity data, for instance, um, or like taking over a science that has been ultimately about critical participation of the public, um, you know, so bringing those questions to people that are already engaging in these conversations and doing so with, uh, you know, policymakers, um, they have the, the inroads to talking, you know, in, in the United States again to folks um, at places like the Office of Science and Technology Policy and other places that can make impactful recommendations. Um, I think that's really like a key strategy. So finding those, those people that are doing it being clear on what our messages and our concerns are, and then you know working alongside those groups to um, to strategically you know kind of move the work forward. Yeah, Stefan. Stefan, I don't think it's working. No, it's not working. This one is working. Okay, great. Um, I would like to ask a bit of a provocative question. And the question is, is it realistic to have open environmental data in a competitive capitalist world? I'm asking this question because I continuously see a conflict even in the way the European Commission, for example, currently puts out funding in Horizon Europe. So there is a lot of talk, or the European Space Agency, for, for example, there's a lot of talk and encouragement to share data, to have open data, to make data open, to have everything open source. That's more or less the current uh, way, the current direction we've been going in Europe also with the satellite data, Copernicus, for example. On the other hand, you the Commission wants to have small companies, SMEs, in there, and there is this very strong kind of economic component of innovation. But yep. the way SMEs are set up, and I've experienced this myself, they are very competitive. So when they have data, they, they will not share the data because there is another SME which competes with them. And the competition in our capitalist world, as we know, mm -hmm. is extremely high. So I'm not seeing this sharing of data then between the companies and the downstream part. <laughs> and this is a real strong uh, um, contradiction I'm constantly facing. So what, what do you think could be, what, what do we need? Do we need a different system? Do we need to think more broadly about you know what you mentioned in the end yeah. to be more kind to be more open and to have a completely different world view i mean that's that's really the fundamental yeah question i have thanks i mean i'm going to start with my activist perspective is that like we have to share climate data period like we can't we cannot address this challenge without an all hands on approach and that includes all of the data sets that we have the reality of it, and this is why a lot of my thinking and my language has started shifting towards commons-based approaches, is that I think it can help us um, get past these dualities that get created between open and proprietary when we're talking about building in different governance frameworks that help people to make decisions that are not within these bounds of you know, open licenses, for instance, uh, about how they share and manage data. So for instance, you know, could it mean and maybe this is a hype dream also, but you know, could it mean that one of the groups you're talking about, maybe they are not willing to share their data, um, you know, which kind of also gets covered under a non-commercial license, but maybe they're not willing to share their data with uh, Pepsi-Cola, right? But there's community groups that are within the, the same region that they're working in, and there's a governance framework that can be put in place that allows for that kind of sharing in a more robust and manageable way. So I think that, for me, I mean, I've been, I've been working on open for a long time and I'm starting, not, not, hold on, I'm gonna take those words back. Um, we see the cracks in it and we see the cracks in um, when we talk about open just from a legal and licensing perspective. So I really, like I encourage us and there's some really cool people that I met yesterday that are starting to think about the governance frameworks um, that will help us get past, you know, some of these contradictions that we're seeing and how people are and are not sharing. 
And I'll also just mention, you know, this is, it's a trend not only from companies or, you know, other large data creators. Um, I've started to see communities that I've supported and worked alongside, you know, question, um, why should I share my data openly when, you know, I've, I come from a historically oppressed community and it means that you're basically asking me to, you know, in theory, give up my IP and give away my data. Um, so there's, I, I agree, there's still a long way to go before we can answer these questions, but I really encourage us to start thinking about governance and design um, rather than putting our, uh, you know, kind of thought pot within these dualities of open and proprietary. Yeah, we have another question. <laughs> Thank you. It's more of a comment, maybe a fuzzy comment. Uh, <clears throat> a lot, a lot of the, a lot of the talk, a lot of the changes, the major changes that uh, you talk about uh, are centered around uh, the digital dimension, uh, AI, um, even the the, the shared uh, knowledge uh, commons. Uh, you know, in reality, what is it? It's uh, some sort of platform, I suppose. Um, and uh, a lot of the solutions, um, I see this this very strong presence of the the digital world and and the social networks. The social networks. It, 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 when I was young, social networks were uh, people uh, uh, linking up with other people uh, locally, uh, person to person. And but you did. Uh, I, I, it's, I'm not saying that that's not in your, in your talk. Um, you, you had examples, you, you had a slide with uh, local solutions, you talk about trust between people, uh, you talk about communities. And so my comment is just uh, that um, uh, we are facing all these, these changes that come from the digital world, and some of the solutions have to do with that, but we mustn't forget the human side, I suppose. So we have, we have to have to find some kind of balance between the two. Yeah, thank you for your comment. I think we have uh, time for one last question. Thank you so much for your uh, nice talk. Um, I was thinking about uh, it's so easy to stay with what is familiar and it's important to do what is unfamiliar, what is at the fringes. So. Um, I want to ask if you can share some of your philosophy or like practical ways in which you uh, keep yourself comfortable at in the unfamiliar. Whoa. <laughs> okay, that's a heavy question. Um, uh, I think, I mean, you know, and this might be an audience to, to say this with, um, is I think when you've been doing something a long time or you've been handed a degree because you've been studying something a long time, um, it gives us this kind of like um, authority complex. Um, and I do a lot of personal work to uh, not to strip that because I mean, I'm, I'm an old person in this space. I have experience. I've you know, done a lot of this work firsthand. Um, but I always want to show up into a room and be ready to listen and to learn. Uh, because there's always going to be new ideas that come up, or even if it's something I don't agree with, um, it's going to make me, it's going to cause me to think in a different way. Um, and so, I mean, maybe like getting back to your comment, I, I'm a community organizer. I listen, like I, I get this. Um, and some of my like discomfort in my early days, I'm not a religious person, and um, in the Deep South, before you start a community meeting, you get together and you pray, and you eat a great meal. And even that like caused me a level of kind of like questioning, you know, can I, can I sit quietly? But it's the power of being with other people, the power of what can happen when we're in collusion with one another, um, you know, when we have these kind of intentionally curated collisions that happen in rooms with people that are like-minded and not like-minded. Um, and so I always, I just never want to not experience that. And so I would just encourage people like, you know, we, we all have our expertises and biases and, you know, we know this thing about the world, but um, everybody else does too. And so try to, try to do work on that, you know, throughout your professional life. Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, Shannon, you said you would write up your talk. I think it is very rich yeah. and inspiring. Um, I would like to offer to share the link in our newsletter. So sure. In our Exxon newsletter, if you're, not, if you're not subscribed yet, you can do it. And then also get the link to um, this keynote today. And now a very big applause for Shannon for her keynote. And now I hand over to Daniel to share some um, administrative information with you. Yeah, before you um, go to the other uh, buildings where the oral presentations and the workshop will take place, some organizational, organizational updates. We have some last-minute cancellations. Um, we have um, two oral presentations.